There are some things that you should know about me before I begin tonight. I am a strong-minded firstborn who in all of my school years was the principal's kid. I was raised in a home with very black and white boundaries and attended a conservative Baptist church. And in everything that I've ever been involved in, I was labeled a natural leader, which I kind of feel like is just a nice way of not using the word bossy. <laughs> so the life mission of someone with this kind of lineup is to, number one, follow all the rules, and number two, make sure everyone else follows all the rules. So you can imagine my elation this summer when at a garage sale, I found a coffee mug that said, I'm not bossy, I'm the boss. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, you guys. Here we are. Now, in all of my maturity, which I'm trying to be like all grown up and mature, I look back on this lineup and all I can see is a very prideful, people-pleasing perfectionist with performance issues and control. And often I don't even see it for myself. So this last summer, my brother got married. It was a destination wedding in Miami. And it was the night before his wedding, we were in the 12th floor suite welcoming all of the out of town guests. And in the door walks James, one of his high school buddies. So I go right over to James, and I was like, hey, James, it's so good to see you. And he's like, hey, Lindsay, good to see you too. Do you remember that road trip that we did when you were in college and we were in high school? I was like, yes, James, I totally remember that road trip. And he was like, so do you remember when Mike threw garbage out the window and we were in the drive-thru and you got out of the car in front of us and you picked up the garbage and you put it back in the window in his lap and you looked at Mike and you're like, Mike, we don't do that. <laughs> and I was like, James, no, I did not do that. He said, yes, you did. <laughs> Truth slap number one. Not 10 minutes later, in the door walks my cousin, Michelle, who had just traveled with her husband from Oregon. And so we go out to the balcony of the resort and we look down at the pool of our resort and the pool of the resort next to us. And she goes, hey, Lindsay, do you remember that road trip that we did as cousins? <laughs> when we were all staying in the hotel room and we looked out the window and there was a couple skinny dipping in the pool down below? And I was like, oh my gosh, Michelle, I totally remember that. And she said, do you remember how you went down to the pool to tell them <laughs> that what they were doing was totally inappropriate and they should probably stop because there's kids watching out the window? <laughs> and I was like, no, I didn't do that. And she said, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> True slap number two. So apparently my coffee mug that I got this summer should say, I'm not bossy, I'm the boss of the whole freaking entire world. <laughs> so I have issues. And there is one woman in this world who totally understands me, and she is a world-renowned researcher named Brene Brown. And she wrote a book called The Gifts of Imperfection where she actually unpacks perfection, performance, pleasing, and pride. And what she says, the trick to combat this in someone's life is to practice vulnerability. And so I am up here now to attempt to practice vulnerability. And I'm about to give you a tour of the inside of my messy mind. And there are some subliminal rules that I have believed that have been disguised as truths and they show up in my life as if-then statements. So the first question that I battle all the time is, am I good enough? And that's because I have perfection issues. And my if-then statements sound a lot like this. If I follow all the rules and live an exemplary life, then God will be pleased with me. That is all of this, perfection, performance, pleasing, and a whole lot of guilt. 
the next one. If my kids continue in the same negative habits and behaviors, then I'm not doing a good enough job parenting them. That is performance and pride and control as if I could control my kids like ever. <laughs> the next one. If I don't meet the needs of helpless people I'm aware of, then God will be disappointed in me. Performance, pleasing, and now another layer of guilt. But that's not the only question I wrestle. The next one is this. Am I doing enough to make a difference? And that's performance right here. And I imagine in a room full of this many women, this question probably gets asked about every 10 minutes of every single day. I don't think I'm alone. Here's what my vulnerable if-then statements sound like, though. If at any point I am enjoying my comfortable life, then I'm not doing enough to sacrificially help others. Performance. If I don't work in a church, nonprofit, or ministry, then I'm not doing enough to move the mission forward, and I'm wasting time here on earth. Pleasing, no, performance, gotta get it right, performance and pride. If my story does not include significant hardship, then I cannot relate to others and God cannot use me as significantly. Pleasing and pride. Now I feel like I just wanna take a minute and pause. Let's be honest, vulnerability is really hard. And I wanna ask for some sympathetic smiles and nods across the room. <laughs> Because you're either saying, I hear you, and I totally get what you're saying, or, wow, you're a hot mess, and I feel really <laughs> bad for you. Either way, the smiles and the nods are the same. Just keep them coming. So in the midst of what I call the life I've lived and the lies that I've believed, there is a truth. It's a hashtag truth. And it is this. God is good semicolon, enough, exclamation mark. Now, my mom is an editor, and she's in this room, and I can't even confidently tell you that that's the correct grammatical way to do that sentence, but we're throwing perfection out the window, and we're going for impact, so we're gonna do it again. God is good, semicolon, enough, exclamation mark. We are trying so hard to be good enough. And that list is an exhausting list of if-thens that all start with if I, if I. And God never wanted it to be about me. In fact, in Acts 17, 28, God says, in him we live and move and have our being. It is not about me. It is all about him. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I don't believe God is talking about a physical rest. I believe he's talking about a spiritual rest, a mental rest from all that we're trying to achieve and do. To be perfect, to perform and do all of this for God to please him and to please everyone else and to do it all in our own power and strength. So what if we did this? What if we traded these if I, then statements with if God, then? Here's what they would sound like. If God says he loves me, then nothing I do or don't do would make him love me any less. And all of the sudden, perfection is traded for freedom. If God created me, then my identity is holy and completely uniquely designed by him. I don't have to become a better version of me. I just have to be the me he made me to be. 
And now performance is traded for identity, freedom and identity. This is a good one. If God created the entire universe in a single breath, then he can choose to use me, but he doesn't need me to accomplish his work here on earth. And now, pleasing is traded for surrender. If God says my life mission is to love then that includes everyone, everywhere, including in business, in fashion, and on vacation. And now pride is traded for purpose. With God at the center of all of this, everything that follows is full of freedom and identity and surrender and purpose. And it turns out, I'm far less significant than I ever thought I was. And it is the most beautifully freeing thing ever. You're at the very beginning of a journey this weekend that God wants to take you through of identifying your if-then statements. What is it that you've been living your life by? And if you trade yourself out and put God in at the center, which you cannot do by yourself, but the Holy Spirit can. And I feel like we're gonna learn this weekend what it feels like to breathe in and breathe out through the Holy Spirit. And I cannot wait to see by tomorrow what is gonna happen in all of our lives. Watch this video. Out of breath. Alone, spent, tired, confused, directionless? Is this what life is meant to be? You were created for a full life, full of the spirit of the living God. When God spoke us into existence, he didn't stop at words. The God of creation breathed into dust and life was formed. He breathed and we were filled with his spirit, marking us, claiming us for abundant life. He breathed and filled us with his breath. Breathe in, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Breathe out, let go of the things that hold you back. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full.